어, 따라 불러주신 거 고맙겠습니다. 어, the title of the singer is All This But Goodies. <웃음> um, so we're going to sing two 60s songs, 70s songs. If you were in the 60s, 70s movement, then probably you remember these songs. 우리 아주 옛날 노래를 할 텐데요. Uh, the first song, 첫 번째 노래는 uh, is We Shall Overcome. I think you should know this song, uh, maybe. So that's, uh, but for people who don't know this song, let's uh, learn it like, line by line. Uh, we shall all be free. We shall all be free. We shall all be
uh, September 17, 1787 was uh, when the U.S. Constitution was signed in Philadelphia. Um, and as the President mentioned, uh, I think it was earlier this week, uh, that document really uh, reflects the core values and the truths uh, that, uh, that we are each endowed with these una unalienable rights. And I know that's something that we, we learn about a lot in school, but, but to really take that and, and, uh, uh, and exemplify it is something I think we all, uh, we all aspire to do. And as the beneficiaries of these rights, uh, we have an obligation to participate in democracy, so that democracy remains vibrant and strong and responsive to all of our needs. Uh, the United We Serve initiative, which I think a lot of you have participated in in, in some capacity, the President's uh, Service Initiative, encouraged all Americans to become involved in volunteer efforts in their communities. Citizens uh, also often engage in government uh, at every level, community level, local, state, uh, certainly the federal level, and civic participation essentially breathes life into these freedoms that are established in the Constitution. It makes the country a great country even better. Uh, the principles serve as a beacon of hope. That's something that's been talked about a lot, especially recently. Uh, and for those who are new Americans, uh, seeks to uh, better the lives of, of, of all of us. Uh, I'm the son of immigrants myself, so I have sort of a soft spot for that story. And, uh, I, I call it the great American story. Essentially, every day we're welcoming new and diverse stories, new and diverse heritages into this great patchwork of our nation. So today, especially, we're very excited to have uh, over 300 people from more than 30 states, from a number of different backgrounds who are here. Um, we, hope, we hope that you uh, become fully engaged, find issues that you care about, join the process, make a difference. Be part of a respectful national debate and dialogue as a concerned and engaged citizen. Um, we invite you certainly to, to do that. And certainly we've been trying to do our part. Uh, even during the, the recent summer recess, some folks uh, took a break in August. Hopefully if you were part of that team, you enjoyed your break. Uh, our offices were hard at work. Um, as you know, the Obama administration is deeply entrenched in getting health reform pushed through Congress. Uh, and I know some folks were hoping we could take a moment to uh, kind of address that this morning, so I'm, I'm happy to do that. As you know, the highlights of, uh, of this include the development of a public plan that can really cover uninsured <laughs> provide coverage for folks without it, and provide stability for folks who have it. Uh, health reform includes increased access. It also includes eliminating discriminations for what are called pre-existing conditions, um, health status, or gender discrimination. As many of you know, you, you understand why health reform is a priority for this administration. And uh, reform will prevent insurance companies from denying coverage to you based on your health. Uh, it will end discrimination that charges you more if you're sick or charges you more if you're a woman. It will also ensure that you have guaranteed choices of quality, affordable insurance if you lose your job, if you switch jobs, if you get sick. Uh, it will ensure coverage for kids' dental, vision, and hearing needs, and promote quality coverage for seniors, including recommended immunizations. Since 2000, um, certainly you're, you're very familiar with the, a lot of the data regarding health reform, but since 2000, uh, average family premiums have increased astronomically. Some of the data in the AAPI community uh, that we've come across recently is that that, that's, that increase is something like 56% in the state of Hawaii alone. Uh, President Obama is committed to working with Congress to pass health reform this year that reduces costs for families, businesses, and governments. It protects people's choice of doctors, hospitals, and health plans, and assures quality, affordable care for all Americans. The need for reform across the country is clear. Uh, as you know, uh, our families just simply can't afford the status quo, and we deserve something better. Uh, on such a uh, historic day, after an incredibly historic election, um, citizenship and participation are themes that I, I think a lot of us uh, find ourselves relating to on a, on a personal level. There have always been challenges before us. Um, these, are, these are steep challenges, by the way, that really require a lot of hard, hard work to address. Um, there is not going to be a simple light switch that we can flip on and have all of these challenges sort of dissolve. Uh, it's the tireless work, quite honestly, that all of you do uh, 
uh, on a daily basis, the community organizing, the letter writing, the passionate dialogue, the discussion, the action that is going to uh, yield results. So we hope that today brings within a continued relationship on a number of important issues. Um, certainly we may not always agree or see eye to eye on everything, but uh, as the White House moves forward on a number of, uh, of agenda items, we hope to continue an ongoing dialogue with you, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of the point of view, there is always room uh, for uh, respectful political discourse, uh, civic discourse, and uh, after all, that's part of the great American spirit that I think we're celebrating today. So we hope you consider our office, the Office of Public Engagement at the White House, uh, a resource as you move forward, uh, as we all move forward, actually, in finding uh, these common solutions to common challenges. So thank you again for, uh, for having me. Have a happy Citizenship Day, and best of luck with the rest of your activities. Thank you, Cal for the work you do with community organizations. Next, we're going to hear uh, again from the administration from Cindy Mann. Uh, Cindy is an old friend of community organizations and has worked tirelessly from the inside and outside the Beltway to ensure that public programs are there when we need them. Currently, she is the director of the Center for Medicaid State Operations at the Department of Health and Human Services, which means we have another friend in the White House. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't make it today. Apparently, as Calpen said, people are busy over at the White House uh, health, uh, talking about health care reform these days. She wasn't able to make it today, so uh, I will present this letter on her behalf, which I'm going to read now. Dear colleagues, I am writing in response to your invitation to participate in a public dialogue on health reform on September 17th. As we discussed, I am unfortunately unable to participate in the meeting due to a long-standing commitment. However, beyond participation in the meeting on the 17th, you also asked to establish a dialogue about access to quality, affordable health care in your communities. I very much wish to pursue such a dialogue and consider how CMS can engage with your groups and around improving access to Medicaid and CHIP. While I won't be able to attend in person, please share with those who are attending at the meeting my appreciation of all the work that NACASAC, NIFCO, CCC, and all other organizations represented today with whom you work have done to improve access to affordable access in your communities. More broadly, I value and I know this administration values your priority that the voices of low-income people be prominent in both assessing and solving issues and concerns in our communities. I look forward to planning future work together on improving health coverage and reducing health disparities. We must do more to address the fact that the risks of our current system frequently fall disproportionately on particular communities and people, including rural communities, Native Americans, African Americans, and immigrants. I appreciate your perspective that we must pay particular attention to these impacts, while at the same time working to achieve our goals by recognizing that we are all in this together, and that the well-being of low-income communities is part and parcel of the well-being of all Americans and all of our communities. Looking ahead, past enactment of legislation that will result in substantially improved access to quality, affordable health care, much work will remain in order to ensure that any health reform legislation that is enacted is implemented well, implemented well at both the federal and state levels. I very much look forward to working together to ensure that the many opportunities we hope will be established through health reform are fully fulfilled. Best wishes, Cindy Mann. So for the remainder of the hour, we are going to hear from uh, grassroots leaders sharing their stories about access to quality health care and question members of Congress about what we can expect to see from the current health reform debate. Thank you, Jean. Next, I'm going to introduce Representative Dr. Judy Chu, who was recently elected in July 2009 to the U.S. House of Representatives from California's 32nd District. She immediately got to work representing the interests of her constituents which include large Asian American and Latino populations and, um, and people of color. Um, she uh, has served as one of the most powerful women in California State Assembly as Chair of Appropriations and as Vice Chair and Chair of the State Board of Equalizations and now is in Congress as a member of the House uh, Committee on Education and Labor as well as the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, Previously, she served as mayor of Monterey Park and was a professor of psychology for 20 years. Please welcome Representative Dr. Judy Chu. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I 
I'm Judy Chu, and I'm proud to say that I've been a member of Congress for a whole two months. <laughs> What a month it's been. On July 16th, I was sworn in in front of the 435 members of Congress, and it was uh, uh, quite a feeling. I, I got uh, to be sworn in by Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and uh, that night uh, I was having dinner with my out-of-town guests when they said, uh, please go to your first committee hearing of the Education and Labor Committee. Uh, it could go late because it's about health care reform, uh, maybe till 1 or 2 a.m., but it went till 6 a.m. So off to work immediately, and there could be no Im more important bill to uh, cut my teeth on than health care reform. Uh, for once, we will have a, a situation where every American can have stability, security, and peace of mind. We will have 45 million Americans that will have the ability to access health insurance. We will have Americans who will no longer have to fear being cut off from their insurance. In fact, never again will you have to fear being denied insurance because of, of, of a pre-existing condition. And never again will you have to fear going bankrupt because of the out-of-pocket out cost, nor will you have to fear uh, having to be cut off from your insurance right in the middle of a serious medical condition. This is a really important bill for all Americans, and that's why it distresses me so much to see the misinformation that is out there that is being perpetuated to Americans all across the country. Nonetheless, I think people do want real reform. I had my town halls, I had four town halls in my district, and uh, you know what? In my town halls, nobody was burned in effigy and nobody bit off anybody else's finger. <laughs> in fact, in my town halls, quite the opposite occurred in my town halls, I had people coming up with desperate story after desperate story, talking about such things as um, one young man who had a wife who was pregnant and uh, was seeking to get insured, but could not get insured because he had a pre-existing condition, he had asthma as a child. Or another man who had worked for his company for 30 years, but then was told by his company that to pay for his cancer treatment, he'd have to pay out of, out of pocket, and he just couldn't afford it, so he didn't know what to do. These are the situations that Americans are facing every day, and it's, it is not acceptable. That's why we do have to pay, pass this uh, health care reform bill. Uh, and I believe that we should have uh, a public option. I think it's important for us to have a robust public option. I believe it is so important for us to have uh, a, a form of insurance that will be affordable for Americans that uh, will be tied to government rates and that can provide competition to the insurance plans that will be in our health care exchange. So we will push as hard as possible for that because I think that is essential to the success of this health care insurance plan. Now, even though this plan will be a great improvement, it is also not a magic bullet. We do, do know that the House version is not perfect. Uh, in fact, there will be still an estimated 17 million that will be uninsured, many of whom are undocumented residents. I do not believe that germs have a green card. And uh, I wish that this was a portion of the bill that could be changed 
but at this point it's, it's quite a political football. And at the very least, we should have the ability to strengthen our community clinics, which of course never ask for any kind of documentation. And this goes on. So it's a lot of the second thing that I think is very important to address this issue is the fact that I don't think there, there should be an undue, burdensome level of documentation that immigrants should have to provide just to access the insurance that is there. And that is one of the issues because there was uh, a uh, health care plan that was passed out of the Senate yesterday which did provide for a higher level of documentation that just regular immigrants would have to show in order to access health care insurance. And unfortunately, when you have all these kinds of barriers, all kinds of hoops that people have to pass through in order to gain access to the insurance, that they actually would already have the ability to, to get into, then, then what happens is that many people are denied insurance. So we must uh, make sure that uh, that there's not this undue level of documentation that immigrants would have to provide in order to access uh, their insurance. Now, uh, while I truly believe that healthcare reform is the most important piece of legislation facing us and will be the most revolutionary bill to change America as we know it, um, it perhaps in my lifetime, there is another crucial issue that is right before us, and that is immigration reform. We can no longer tolerate a situation. We can no longer tolerate a situation where immigrants are made to be the scapegoat of society. Many immigrants pay taxes, they work hard, they contribute to this society, but 12 million immigrants live in the shadows because there is no way for them to become legal. As a result, they are exploited in the workplace, pay less, given no benefits, and have no security for their futures. Our immigration system is broken, and it is time that we fix it. And there, there are several things that we must do. We must protect the family and repair a bureaucratic system that forces immigrants to live apart from their families. Actually, I had a case that just came into my office. This is Maria, an American citizen, who came into our district office and uh, just recently, and she had two children, ages two and four, and I'll never forget this because she was crying so many tears as she talked about her story. She'd gone to Ciudad Juarez with her husband for an appointment with an immigration official, and um, she was petitioning for her husband to receive legal status. Uh, they were told the process would take only two weeks, so just in case they saved enough money for her husband to stay in Juarez for up to two months. However, the two months went up and they were told by the officials that they had not demonstrated uh, hardship and they would have to wait for another official to review their case. Well, they waited and waited and now it's uh, been several months, more than a year, actually it's been more than a year since her husband left the family and was stranded in Ciudad Juarez um, because uh, he does not have his papers. He is barred from re-entering the country for up to 10 years. Up to 10 years, can you believe that? And it's because of a law that was passed by Congress to make it tougher for undocumented immigrants to acquire legal status through marriage. Well, now Maria is left without her husband's income. And she's lost her home. She's forced to do, uh, she was forced to do a short sale because she could not keep up with the mortgage payments without her husband's income. Her children wake up in the middle of the night crying for their daddy 
and uh, they don't know, she doesn't know how to explain this all to them. Um, and I think this sounds like a lot of hardship, don't you? <laughs> well, these family separations are cruel and counterproductive. It is families that historically have helped immigrants assimilate into American life and given immigrants the support and resources they need to become successful and productive members of our society. I think there are a couple of other things that we must do. We must penalize employers who would hire undocumented workers and exploit their status for their own gain. And in fact, I just went to this place called the Vermont Car Wash. Um, and I was picketing there with, with uh, a number of, um, of labor leaders. But the non-compliance with the law is rampant. Workers are paid less than half of minimum wage, about $3 an hour. They work 50 to 60 hours a week. Uh, they are not given any of the state mandated kinds of privileges, which is overtime, rest periods. In fact, they have to drink water out of the washing machine. And they earn an average of $12,000 a year with no benefits. In fact, in some car washes, they live only on tips. And why are they treated this way? For profit. Car washes in particular are very profitable with a typical return of more than 40%. Well, the workers are exploited this way because the employers feel they can get away with it. And this must stop. We must make sure these employers are made to pay for the laws that they violate. And finally, we must provide a clear path to citizenship for otherwise law-abiding, undocumented immigrants who live and work in the U.S. <laughs> These immigrants should register and pay their taxes, but they should become uh, allowed to get out of the shadows and be vested, productive members of our society. And for the first time, we have the ability to do this. We have a Congress that is willing to do this. We have a president that is willing to do this and has been willing to uh, get his Homeland Security um, Secretary Janet Napolitano to uh, start the hearings for an immigration reform agenda. And in fact, just last night I was at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus dinner where the president reiterated his desire to get immigration reform to occur. So I feel very encouraged, but you know what we need? We need your voice. We need your advocacy. We need you to keep up the pressure. Because you know what, you know, the problem here is that there is a lot of hysteria across this nation. We have many people who are very polarized on this issue, and they would blame immigrants for all their problems. We need rational voices. We need people to talk about how immigrants contribute to the society. And in fact, I know a little bit about this myself. My grandfather came to this country with nothing. And uh, in fact, he was the object of laws, laws that excluded him from citizenship because there was a Chinese exclusion law at the time which prevented citizens from becoming naturalized citizens. And uh, these same laws in California uh, actually prevented him from owning land and from uh, also be being hired in any corporation. But he decided to make something of it and he worked night and day to, uh, to own a small restaurant, use that very expensive labor, his sons. They, they made, it, made ends meet, finally was able to support his family. Uh, and now two generations later, his granddaughter is a member of Congress. I know immigrants can contribute to this society. Uh, let's make sure that uh, we have immigration reform and that we have health care reform. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.
uh, those words. Um, we're going to hear now from a couple of grassroots leaders um, who have some stories about healthcare. So, and then we'll have a chance actually to respond. Uh, some great places here. First, we're going to hear from Eric Glass, who is a grassroots leader from uh, Portland, Oregon. Hello, um, my name is Eric Glass, I'm from Portland, Oregon. To me, I think citizenship means being a part of the community and helping make sure it's healthy. I think that in life, it's important to have something to believe in. At one time, I thought it was a game, but after having my eyes open to the things in life that keep people down, I decided to take a new track. I decided I needed to do something for my community. That's why I've been dedicated to working on the injustices in society in Portland in particular. I work for the organization that uses the music and the arts to try to keep kids out of gangs and to activities that keep them on the right side of the law. Even then, one of the problems experienced this person was being stopped by Portland cops. They thought I drove a flashy car. Then my name was wrongly posted on a website listing people who were involved in prostitution. This is one of the reasons I am also working with Oregon Action to fight racial profiling. A key tactic to fight the racism that leads to profiling and data collection, requiring the police department to record all of their stops and arrests. Without the right documentation, these problems can be denied by the status quo and ignored. The same solution applies to health care. It's clear that African American and people of color generally make up too large of a percentage of the people who are uninsured, but without that on race and ethnicity, it is impossible to identify the right solution to the problem of racism. What are you and what is Congress going to do to make sure the right data is collected in the health care system so we can identify where there is clear and racial bias in health outcomes? Before you respond, I have one more story from Alexander Tsao, who's coming from Columbia, Missouri. Hello. My name is Alexander Tsao, and I have lived in Missouri for the past 12 years. I am currently a senior at the University of Missouri, majoring in strategic communications. Since I was a freshman, I've been active with the Asian American Association, an on-campus organization working to support and bring awareness to the issues that Asian, Asian Americans of Pacific Islanders uh, and minority students face. And for the past two years, I was the president for the, for the Asian American Association. My parents are small business owners in Seattle, Missouri. And, and as first generation immigrants, I had trouble <laughs> navigating the public health care program. When I turned 19, I was no longer eligible for insurance under my parents. I became among the race of the uninsured. There's no way that I can now afford insurance, and being a full-time student, there is no time for a job that might offer health insurance. The university provides one checkup per semester, but that doesn't cover any needed treatments that those checkups might discover. Without insurance, I always have to be extra careful with all my activities. Oftentimes, I need to do self-diagnosis and just hope for the best. I know I'm going, I'm among the millions that have the same worry that I do, and I think this is wrong. I think everyone should have the peace of mind that they can afford to be healthy. Healthcare is a basic right, and everyone should have access. Representative Chu, what are you and what is Congress going to do to help the millions like me who are uninsured? How is Congress going to make sure that everyone can afford the only affordable health? Thank you, Alexander, for presenting too. We, have, we are sort of short on time. Would you be able to say a couple of comments? For your response? I, think, I think a lot of those questions you, uh, you addressed before. Well, I just want to thank you for your very eloquent words. Uh, your testimony is exactly what the health care reform bill addresses. And in particular, we want to make sure that there are better outcomes in health and that the racial disparities are addressed in this bill. 
but also that we have concrete data on what works and what doesn't work in our healthcare system. And uh, I, I, for you with uh, the um, young man without, without the healthcare insurance, this is the crime need in our country. Nobody should have that uh, burden on your mind of worrying about whether you could have some serious illness addressed. But everybody will have access once this healthcare reform bill is passed. So, do we have time for questions? We're good. I think we have time for one question um, following the testimony. Yes. Oh, well, um, my family and I, we're not, we're not eligible for government health insurance because our income does not meet that requirement, but yet we can't afford a private company's health insurance. So, I was wondering what you're standing on like, situations like mine, like that kind of gas situation. <laughs> Well, um, I, I take it then you, you don't qualify for, for Medicaid because you're, you probably have um, uh, an income that's higher than that. Uh, but at the same time, of course, you can't afford insurance because the premiums are way out of, uh, uh, out of the reach of so many Americans. And that's what this health care reform bill will uh, change so, so dramatically. Uh, it will uh, provide a health care insurance exchange so you, as an individual, family can go in there and uh, compare all the different plans and see what is affordable to you. All these plans will have to have certain basic things like uh, inpatient hospital care, outpatient hospital care, physician services, prescription drug, drugs, um, so they can't cheat you and, and just you know not have something in there that uh, is very, very important. <laughs> and um, if the premiums seem high for what you can afford, there will be affordability credits up to 400% of the poverty level. Uh, so they, there will be credits that can help you pay for that insurance. And that's a really important part to make sure that we have more Americans uh, be able to afford their health insurance. Thank you, Representative Chu, for your leadership. And um, we look forward to meeting with you and other members of Congress later today, um, which is why we have so many people um, gathered on citizenship. Thank you. Uh, our next guest today is uh, Representative Mike Honda. Representative Honda is from the 15th District of California in the San Jose region. He has long been an advocate for people of color and is very familiar to a lot of people in the room. Um, he currently chairs the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and has most recently helped to lead the winning fight to remove the five-year bar for legal immigrant children in Medicaid and SG. Close ally to community organizations in California, many of which are represented in the room today, and we are glad to have them here today. Uh, I'd like to welcome Representative Mike Hunter. I'm just looking around to see who's here. Good morning. Good morning. Are you Jose O? We're here to um, advocate issues that um, are very important to folks like ourselves who, whose uh, members of our community sometimes don't know all the details of what's going on in our lawmaking. And so um, that's why unity of uh, uh, movement is a uh, very, very important aspect of uh, community organizing that folks like yourselves be armed with information 
So you can do a couple of things. One, talk among your own peers and let them know what's going on or what's not going on. Two, understand what should be and make sure that everybody knows what should be. And then three, make sure that people like myself understand how you feel about what's not happening or how you feel about what should happen. And so this is all part of having a voice in democracy. I come from a, a third generation uh, immigrant family. Uh, my grandparents uh, just didn't know what the laws were. They just came here to earn enough money to pay the debts that they have incurred in Japan. My grandparents, my parents were born here and, and stayed. And so they grew up thinking they were Americans. Well, they were. They were born here. Uh, this is one Honda that was made in America. <laughs> so, there's two things we want to talk about right now on healthcare. Historically, healthcare, uh, as it regards to Medicaid, um, some welfare uh, reform issues that was passed a few years ago, and then today, is that they're maintaining a five year ban on being able to enjoy the benefits of healthcare. Now, if you're a legal permanent resident, that means you've been here over five years. Right? You do the math. If you're here five years, and you're legal permanent resident, you have a green card, you should be able to be eligible. Uh, just like any other citizen. Second, um, the new bills that keep coming through, we don't see that as an opportunity to change the issues to a more positive and inclusive, uh, um, inclusive way. Right now, we do have that opportunity. We have this issue of healthcare reform. A couple of things. One, we want to make sure that the legal permanent residents are able to have that five-year ban lifted. Kind of a rationale. If we're talking about fairness, this country is supposed to be fair. This country is supposed to be um, looking at things that um, are socially, um, there's social justice involved in our, uh, in our laws so that it doesn't separate people and say, this law is for you, but this law is not for me. The law is supposed to be applied to everybody, especially in the area of healthcare where we know that. If we don't have proper health care, two things happen. There's more burden on the general taxpayers. And then it also means that our health gets worse until we really need something to go to an emergency. And this is the part I didn't understand before is that go to an emergency room. A lot of the emergency rooms, it's not a law, but what they do is they go through the emergency process protocol so later on they will get sued. And therefore, the whole process is more expensive, four to five times more expensive. So if we are to be fiscally responsible, we should lift that back. And if we don't want to create more burden on our tax base, we should lift that back. So if people are not fiscally responsible, if they are fiscally responsible, but they still don't want us to access that help, what does that say about our country? them accepting us as people. Is it about race? I don't know. It could be. It has been in the past. So either one should not be the reason for denying access to our health care. And so um, we, we want to have, make sure that every one of you become active participants in changing the law and shaping it. If we do it right the first time, then it's easy. But if it's not done right the first time, then it's harder because we have to educate and re-educate to do the right thing. In teaching, we say that if you teach the wrong material, the wrong information, it takes 33 times more effort. So you are part of the 33 times effort to make this happen. I think uh, right now 
the chances of those kinds of things are, are most possible now. We have a Congress that's supposed to have more Democrats. We have a Senate that's supposed to have more Democrats. Therefore, they should be more understanding and more amenable to change them to do the right thing. So we have to take our story and put it in front of them. Okay? We have to put our face in front of their face and articulate the problem. Much like what was said before. I'm a young adult male, single, I'm outside of my family's um, coverage, but I can't get coverage. I have, I'm a diabetic, I'm, I'm single, I'm not with my parents, I can't get insurance because they say pre-existing conditions exist. I'm working, I get laid off, and all of a sudden I don't have coverage again. And I can't get coverage because my coverage was hooked into my job. So any of those situations, if we pass the health reform, those things will be addressed. But they need to be addressed with knowledge and understanding, and so you have the knowledge, you have the understanding, you have the experience. So now you have to take that in front of the lawmakers and say to them, in your heart, would you allow your family members to be in this situation? In your heart, would you allow members of your families to be in this situation? I would suspect we would say no. But I think that sometimes they're separated from reality and, and trying to hook only into politics. And on the politics side, you have to let them know that either you can vote or you can get voted. If you're not a citizen, you're here on a permanent, um, really permanent uh, residency or a green card, you can tell them I can get 10 votes. You can tell them I can get 10 votes. And they can count. So make, so make your actions pay off in the long run. So the proposal to shut out people we know who may be undocumented, people who we know that may be permanent residents, people we know who are citizens all deserve coverage. Politics will say we may be able to cover everybody except the undocumented. My book was to cover them all. The way we do it here now is that no federal monies will be used to subsidize undocumented. They say illegals, but we say undocumented because you're all born legal. So we have to say undocumented, undocumented. My mom was legal. My dad was legal. They were married, so I must be legal too. It's just that we, by life circumstances, we had to do things that forced us to do the right thing for our own families. Okay, so right now, on top of not allowing federal money to be used for undocumented, there's talk now of not allowing the undocumented to buy their own private plans, even if they have the money. Now, really, that doesn't make any sense. Think about it. You're not going to be able to buy your own plan, even if you have your money. That means that you may have to dip into tax if you go to the emergency. That's going to cost more. When you're willing to pay and not be a burden, there's lots of folks out there that can do that. I know a lot of them. Some of them put the cable in my house. So I'll put my cable box together. So we're trying to be, I don't know what we're trying to be as politicians, but certainly we're not following the principles of the United States Constitution that we're supposed to be all created equally, have the same rights, and be able to pursue what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the Constitution. And so, 
You have to fight for those things. Speak up to be heard. Stand up to be seen and act in order to give what it is that you need. Thanks so much. grassroots leaders you see in the audience today, they've come to BC to celebrate citizenship and particularly find out how this Congress is going to shape the health reform debate. First, we have a question from Chung Jin Lee from Los Angeles. My name is Jung Hee Lee. I came to the United States in 1995 with two children, and in 1992 I applied for green card. In 2009, I got my green card. It's a long process. A long process. <웃음> 그렇지만 어, 2002내 어, 그, 어, 남편이 비즈니스 오픈했고요, 스몰 비즈니스 오픈했고요. 그리고 어, 2002에 또 저는 또 집도 샀습니다. In 2002, my husband was able to open a small business, and in 2002, uh, we also bought a house. 어, 저는 어, 제가 2001부터 2002부터 이제 어, 저는 일을 했기 때문에 인플로이 텍스를 냈고요. 우리 허스반은 비즈니스 텍스를 냈습니다. In 2002, because I had my job, I paid my employment taxes, and my husband paid taxes for a small business. 그렇지만 그때부터 이렇게 비즈니스가 커, 이렇게 좀안 좋은 그 경제가 생겼어요. Since then, the business has not been doing all that well. 그렇지만 저는 어, 제 인플로이 텍스도 냈고 제 남편은 비즈니스 텍스로 어, 비즈니스가 안 좋아지면서 세컨 모기지로 비즈니스 텍스를 커버했습니다. Um, so since then, as I said, I've been paying my employment taxes, and my husband's business has not been so good, but paid taxes by taking second mortgage. Very expensive. So for seven years, I paid my taxes, I abide by all the rules, I worked hard, I've been an active citizen. And then when I hear clauses such as legal immigrants having to wait five years, how does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense to me as being somebody who really needed and deserved it. So, Congressman Honda, what is? What do you think about the situation, and what do you think about helping people like me? Well, you were here five minutes ago, and you heard my position, <laughs> but I, I didn't think that you had to wait. And in your case. Um, you're, you and your family are on the path to what we call the American dream. Right? You came here with documents. You got your legal papers. You got a job. Your husband got a job. You started a small business. You paid your taxes, both personal and business. You had children. How old are they? Uh, my daughter is. 18, my son is 16. 18 is, when did you get married when you were 10? <laughs> <laughs> 18 and 10, 18 and 16. Yeah. And the big danger is that soon your children will be um, independent and they may have to get their own insurance. Uh, if they don't have pre-existing conditions, that's one thing that's gone, that's a worry. 
if they have a job with a company that's large, that negotiated a good health plan, they don't have to worry. But if they're on their own, or they don't have a job, big work. Even if you have the money to pay for the insurance, they won't recover. Even if it's the same company that you're using for all those years, you want to extend it to the children who would be independent, they won't be covered under the current law. So if this reform is passed, one, your children will be covered. Two, pre-existing conditions would matter. Three, if they got laid off, they still have And four, it would be affordable for them to be in Now the law says that you all have to have insurance. But if you're the poorest of the poor or the smallest business that's really struggling, then you'll get subsidies. And if you're covering yourself, covering the uh, employees, you get tax credits. But currently, um, in terms of, if you did all that, you're all right. But if you want to enjoy it, and you have not finished the five years, you're still out of luck. So that's why this, this is so important. And you have a good story. You tell them, figure out how many, how many dollars you pay in taxes. How many dollars you pay in property taxes. How many people you employ. And how many taxes that pay. And your, and your husband, and then what that all means. And if we multiply that by all the small businesses in this country, that's a lot of money. If you multiply that by all the folks who had started business like yourself, it's a lot of money. But aside from money, you are participating and contributing to the health of this country. And that's the bottom line. To be a citizen, you have to participate in the So uh, make the politicians follow and understand the Constitution. We took an oath not to the government. We took it over to the Constitution. So if we're not following the Constitution we have this vision, then we don't have to sort it out. Um, uh, Hal Penn Modi from um, the White House and also um, Cindy May.